Angel is brought to you by NetSuite from Oracle. The only system you need to run your business. Go to netsuite.com slash angel to get your free guide called Crushing the Five Barriers to Growth. Hey, everybody. Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Angel, the podcast. I'm your host, Jason Calacanis. I am an angel investor in 150 companies, six of which became unicorns. What's a unicorn? A unicorn is a billion dollar company. And so I'm pretty good at what I do. I wrote a book, angelthebook.com. And we have this great podcast, angelpodcast.com, which you can go listen to all 20 episodes. We've done two seasons of 10. And one of the great guests in the history of the show, the young history of the Angel Podcast, was Ed Roman. Ed Roman is with me today for Ask an Angel. Welcome back to the program. First time we've had a guest on twice. Thanks for having me here, Jason. It's a privilege to be here and excited to answer these questions with you today. Yeah. And so we're going to do Ask an Angel, in this case, Ask Angels, Ask Two Angels. Um, and we get a lot of questions because angel investing is something that is a new profession. People have been doing it as a, a side gig or for fun, but it's really becoming a profession. You are, in fact, Ed, a full-time angel investor. That's right. I manage a venture brand called Hack VC, and we do early stage investing. Very similar syndicate model to what you do, Jason. Yeah. And so it's becoming more of a career for us than a hobby. Right. And yeah, what a great career it is. What draws you to this career? I think what attracts me to this is probably what attracts you to it too, which is the ability to make an impact across multiple companies. Because if you build one startup at a time, then you're very much involved at the tactical level building that company, which is fun. But you know, for me. My, my mind tends to work in strategic ways. I like to be involved at the strategic level. And to be able to do that across several companies engages that side of my brain. So I really, really enjoy that. And I think for people who have been in the game for a decade or two or three, it becomes really like a fun way to get the buzz and the high of startups without all the lows. You can weather the lows a lot better when you've got 50 companies or 150 than you, when you have one. Yeah, I, I look at angel investing and venture capital as a very, very slow way to make a significant amount of money. And so it's, mm. it's a hedge strategy, I guess, across a variety of companies. Right. You're not going to own 40% or 30% of Amazon or Google, but you might wind up owning 1% of one of those and be good for life. That's right. I've heard. Uh, okay. So let's go to the questions here. Thank you to Emmy Award winning producer Jackie for setting up these questions. Our first question comes from Alan. And this actually is a question that came into my email box. We may have changed the names here to protect the new angel investors uh, who are struggling with some of the questions that we may be banging our head against the wall uh, and trying to solve ourselves. This one's going to be familiar to you, Ed, I think. Uh, and Alan asks us, when I invested in a company recently, they told me they had 12 months of runway, but they ran out in six months. Should I be concerned and should I continue to fund the company? Uh, Ed, you must have had this happen, uh, where the runway projection, how many months the company can last on the current uh, amount invested, did not add up, and the company came back early. When this happens, uh, what do you do? And as Alan asks, should he be concerned, and should he continue to fund them? Well, it's a great question, Alan, and thanks for asking it. Um, this does happen from time to time with startups. It's inevitable. So as an investor, you should be prepared for this. You shouldn't be, shouldn't be too shocked because, you know, you're going to see it all eventually as an angel investor. Um, when you first make your initial investment, I would recommend asking the company whether their run with their projecting is based on revenue projections or whether it's based on no revenue projections, because that'll give you an indication of whether 12 months actually is their optimistic scenario where they actually are earning significant revenues or not. That's the first thing I would, I would ask. And then... Find out the source for why it got cut down from 12 to 6 months. What is the reason for that? Is it that they missed their milestones for hitting their revenue numbers? Or is it because they ran over on costs and didn't manage their burn rate properly? And the second concern is a little bit more alarming to me than the first concern. You know, it's pretty often that a company might not achieve product market fit and hit their revenue milestones because guess what? All entrepreneurs are optimists. That's the definition of being an entrepreneur is to have these lofty projections that you usually don't hit because you have an optimistic view of the world. That's kind of like the nature of the personality of being an entrepreneur. And that is an asset. It is being an Being optimist, optimistic is a requirement. In fact, being delusional uh, or clueless can actually, in some cases, help a founder because they're going into a startup where they don't know how hard it's going to be. And I, I like uh, the why. I think this is the thing you have to determine, Alan. You have to get in there and say to the founder, 
oh, you need to raise more money? Let's get together uh, in my conference room, not at a cafe, in a quiet room. Let's roll up our sleeves, bring me your P&L, let's bring your projections, and let's go over your projections, uh, and let's really dig into this and figure out what we need to do to uh, make sure we don't, we're not off by 50% the next time we do funding. In other words, don't be accusatory, be helpful. I always like to start with the assumption of good faith. Now, you may be disappointed when you ask that why, a nice short question. I love one word questions. Why? Why did we miss the projection? Walk me through it. What you might find is, to your point, Ed, I think it's a good one. Oh, we estimated we would have the product out in, in four months, and we estimated we would grow 30% a month, month over month in revenue, and we actually it took us an extra four months to get the product out, and therefore we ran out of money. But this is a big miss, 50% off. It's a huge miss, and it, it is alarming in my mind. You know, that, yeah. is, that is not a lot of time that you have. And so the, the key questions to, to de-risk, I think, are what is their milestone for the next round? So you know, if you retrench with them and figure out what their new projections are, where they expect to be, I might validate through other investors who plan on leading those future follow-on rounds whether those milestones are reasonable in their minds to write a larger follow-on check in the next round. So to kind of validate those milestones, like if this is a seed investment, you want to validate the Series A milestones. In general, I'm, I'm a fan of the fact that initial investors should be responsible for helping to bridge the company towards future rounds if we believe the team is performing well and we still believe in the, in the vision of the company. But I, I might also talk to other co-investors you've had in the initial round you invested in and see if they're also want to come, come into the round with you hmm. to build a round together so that you're not just doing it alone. Yeah, in fact, I had a couple of situations where I felt like people were leaning on me because they had a syndicate to keep funding the company. And I said to the founder, there are eight investors in the last round. If you can get all eight investors to do you know, 20% of what they put in the last round for the bridge, I'll do it. And I'll do double. I'll do 40% of what I, my initial investment, if you get everybody else to do 20%. You know what happened? He went to everyone with that pitch. They got seven of eight people. And oh. the one person was getting married and had no money and a sob story. It's a great, uh, a great example. And it's a good example also of why you don't want to be the only investor carrying the bag, so to speak, hmm. for a round. This is why it's good to co-invest, is that you have other deep pockets available in these kinds of situations. Many hands make for light work, as my father would say when he was bossing us around in his restaurant. And the many hands were helping him not have to do the work. I'm, <laughs> I'm kidding, Dad. I'm kidding. All right. Uh, let's take another question here on Ask an Angel. This question comes from Felix. And Felix asks, after reading Angel, review posted on Audible. Thank you. My mom thanks you. I took the plunge and started investing in syndicates. Do you have a rule of thumb for a syndicate backer? Assuming I'm, ba I'm, ex I'm backing experienced leads such as you, Gil Pancina, Tom Williams, et cetera, should the strike rate be more like one in 20, one in 10? It's a good question. So when investing in syndicates, and Ed Roman has his as well, what do you think you should expect in terms of syndicates are obviously early stage, sometimes very early stage. What do you think the hit rate should be? One in 10, one in 20, and is it any different than angel investing here in Silicon Valley? It's a great question, Felix. And my quick take on it, let's, there's two different parts of your question. Your first question is about what should you be looking to do as a syndicate backer, meaning how can you be valuable? How can you be a good backer? Um, the two things I'd encourage you to look at, one is offer to be helpful to the company. Describe mm -hmm. to the syndicate lead what your unique value add is for that particular deal. Mm -hmm. And if there's a way you can help the company, then you could offer to be connected to the company. Now, if you can't really add value, then don't do that. But mm. in situations where you can add value, it actually helps us as syndicate leads to have backers who actually get involved and help because then we as syndicate leads can then muscle our way into deals mm. ahead of venture capitalists and other institutions because our sources of capital, which is you as the backers, are smart money rather than just dumb money, limited partners, which would be the case of a venture capital firm. And so I actually see it as an advantage if you offer to help. And the second thing I would say is maybe don't expect too many updates sometimes from the companies. Hmm. Because a lot, of, a, lot, a lot of times the best performing companies aren't the greatest at keeping their investors up to date. And so I would just think of this as a long game over many years yeah. um, and be a little bit patient in that regard. And what about the strike rate? I think he means the win rate, you know, how many times a company is going to do well. You've done 50 investments, I think, or so? Yeah, about ballpark. 75. Yeah. 75. Yeah. And if you were to look back on them... You think one out of five 
went on to future funding, one out of 10, just ballpark uh, with your syndicate. What do you expect to hit? One in 10, one in 20? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I would say that it depends on the stage. So if we're doing a pre-seed round, which is like the very earliest first money into a company, the hit rate's going to be very low for that because mm-hmm. there aren't necessarily a lot of capital available for the company at that time. The team is brand new. They might not be at product market fit. There's a lot of issues. The company's very unstable. Whereas when the company's doing a later stage round of financing, you know, if they're in the $50, $100 million range of valuation, we expect those companies to generally survive. Hmm. And so I would say that it varies depending upon your stage. And so as an investor, maybe one question to ask yourself is, at what stage are you investing? Are you investing early or late? If you're investing early, you need to be making more bets across a wider variety of companies to hedge against those odds versus later stage investing. I think that's exactly right. Um, I love your point about providing extra value because what we're going to see, I think, in the future is the best syndicates are going to be oversubscribed. I know you've dealt with being oversubscribed. Uh, Tom Williams has dealt with that. We've certainly dealt with it. We have 2,300 members now, and we typically have three or four times the number of people who want to get in uh, to a deal than we have room for. So I think that that is going to become the future of it. We haven't actually decided to pick people based on their value add yet, but it's on the table. And I think what we're gonna do is send a survey to folks, hey, um, how can you be valuable? Fill out this form. And just by filling out the form, we might put you in a different category. Um, And then we're gonna go to our uh, portfolio companies that have done a syndicate and say, these are the members of your syndicate. Can you tell us which ones have done the best work for you, if at all, and see? And so this is a new kind of concept, which is, Again, if the syndicate members can provide value, that's great. In terms of strike uh, strike rate, as you're calling it, hit rate, I would say one in 25 is my unicorn count, but that is pretty unique. Uh, most people might hit a unicorn every 100 or 200 here in Silicon Valley. You've hit, you haven't hit a unicorn yet. We have we have a few of them in our portfolio. You have a few? Yeah, we're in about the same hit rate as you are. Oh, okay, yeah. so one every 25. Yeah. Yeah, so I think that is what I would call elite level. Uh, hit rate. And so you, this is why picking a syndicate lead who has a track record, that's the whole concept behind this, is that you should be able to get a higher hit rate. That's why you're paying the carry to the to the investor. You're paying the VIG, as it were, the 20% to get in on their deals. So um, I would say putting it at 1 in 20 is, is a nice conservative estimate. Maybe you get a return on 1 in 20. 1 in 10 might be a little aggressive. But if you did get a significant return on 1 in 20, it would have to be more than 20x for you to break even. And in a company like com.com, which we'll have some news about, uh, there's been some news buzzing around town, they've done very well. And I think uh, across all of our investments, we could see one investment paying for 100 or 50. You certainly have that dynamic in your portfolio. Absolutely. And, and it's a really good illustration of why missing out on a good deal is kind of problematic as an investor. Because if you lose money as an investor, if a company fails... What, what have you lost? You've lost your initial investment. You've lost that 1x capital that you've put in. But if you miss out on a company that has a 100x return, that could pay for 99 failures. Right. And so just being in the right deals, having the right access, mm-hmm. going with syndicate leads like Jason, who have that access to yep. the best deals, that is critical. And being diversified, super important. And doing small bets in the beginning while you learn, something we, we talk about in the book. Um, if you haven't read the book bef- yet, it's angelthebook.com, uh, and you can find it on Audible as well. Okay, when we get back from this quick break, we're going to take another six questions from early angel investors in their career trying to figure out this alchemy that we're in, right? It's, it's not a science. It's not magic. Somewhere in between, there's a little bit of alchemy going on here. Uh, and when we get back on Angel, the podcast. Okay, everybody, let's talk about something important. The top barriers to your growth, to the growth of your startup. Well, an Inc. 5000 survey tackled this very topic, the top barriers to growth. And here are those top barriers. Number one, it takes finance too long to close the books. We've all been there. Two, the company is too slow to launch new products. We've all been there as well. Three, hiring and keeping good people. We all know that's difficult. And number four, managing cash. Very hard. And number five, too many disconnected systems. We're all struggling through this. And finally, it's hard to get a full picture of your biz. Yes, that's what Inc. 5000 learned when they did their survey of the top barriers to growth. And because people have outgrown their business and financial management systems, they are facing these very six issues. 
That's why QuickBooks and spreadsheets might be fine to start, but eventually it starts taking two, three, four times as much work to get answers for your business. And those answers aren't always correct. They're outdated, they're incomplete. And you should know that the number one system for growing companies is NetSuite for Oracle. So when you outgrow all this QuickBooks and spreadsheets and disparate systems, and you want to really get your company to the next level, you need NetSuite from Oracle. NetSuite is the one system that tracks and manages revenue, cash flow, HR inventory projects, and even e-commerce for every industry. Now you can run your business from a dashboard on your phone. That's why thousands of companies use NetSuite. It's the only system you need to run your business. So here's your call to action. Go to netsuite.com slash angel, netsuite.com slash angel, and get your free guide. And that guide is called Crushing the Five Barriers to Growth. That's netsuite.com slash angel, netsuite, S-U-I-T-E, dot com slash angel, the only system you're going to need to run your business. Thank you so much to NetSuite from Oracle for partnering with us on Angel Season 2. Thanks again to the team at NetSuite. Okay, let's get back to this amazing episode. Welcome back to Angel the Podcast. I'm your host, Jason Calacanis. I'm here with my good friend and collaborator, Ed Roman. Welcome back to the program. Congratulations on being the first two-time guest. Thank you, Jason. It's a privilege to be here. <laughs> and uh, you got good feedback on your first episode, I think. Yeah, I did. And, and uh, you know, I, I, I'm just really grateful that, you know, you're able to help these angels in the world to become better investors because I think by teaching each other and helping each other with best practices, we can all make smarter investment decisions. Yeah, and that's what it's all about. This is a new discipline. While people have been angel investing for literally decades here in Silicon Valley, probably, you know, some of the famous ones, people investing in Apple or Microsoft early on, there weren't exactly angels at that time. There were just people who got who were rich who got hit upon by founders to give them money before they went to a venture capitalist. But a lot of times in the old days, you would just go right to a VC with an idea, and the VC would fund a team with an idea and a business plan. Those days are long over. You would agree, Ed? I agree exactly because what happened was this concept called lean startup, mm, where explain. entrepreneurs can now iterate to what's called product market fit, which means actually building a product that people use, where they actually are getting paid for their service. That that type of iteration can now be done much more cheaply than it could be done in the past. In the past, you had to buy a bunch of hardware. You had to, you know, the cloud was not available yet, right? Um, you know, you had, it took you six to 12 months just to build a product just to release it. These days, developers can build a product in a few weekends, get a minimum viable product out there, test it in the market, get feedback. The real cost of running a company is the people, the engineers, mm -hmm. and not so much hardware and network bandwidth and stuff like that, which means that it's cheaper to build a company which means that angels like us can have unique opportunities to invest in companies just like VCs used to do. Right. And in fact, we, we even get them a little bit later because the VCs would invest in the team and the business plan. Now, you and I are investing in teams with products with modest traction to medium traction, I would say, most of the time. Uh, okay, let's take another question. This one is from Shane. And Shane says, do you have an advi any advice on becoming an advisor to startups? Any tips or tricks this is something I want to do for my career. The idea of helping other founders has been a driving force in my life. In one form or another, I have never just, I, I just never really realized it. Okay, great question. Here's what I did. I'll, I'll take this one really quick. I was an advisor to a number of companies and I would put in a very small amount of money, five, 10, $15,000. And then I would ask for a quarter point, a half point, uh, 35 basis points in uh, equity as an advisor at that round of funding, so if it was a $4 million round at that strike price, and vested over two years monthly with no cliff because I would start get doing work immediately. And I would say to them, hey, for two years, I'm going to do X, Y, and Z. I'm going to be available, you, available to you unlimited by phone and email. I'll do a once a month uh, meeting at your office or lunch to go over stuff. I'll provide introductions to everybody I know. And that worked for a lot of people. And I, in fact, forgot that I used to ask for this type of advisorship. And recently, two different companies that I had invested in, I forgot I had advisor shares, and they had gone over 10x. And the person said, by the way, would you like to sell your advisor shares? And I said, I have advisor shares? He said, yeah, you have, have $250,000 in advisor shares. I said, I do? And they said, yeah, you do. And I said, oh, who wants to buy them? And they said, oh, this big private equity firm that's you know, doing this funding. And I said, oh, no, I don't want to sell them if they're buying. 
uh, tell them absolutely not. And they're like, okay, but it's $250,000. Like, yeah, but the private equity firm is going to go 10x from here. That might be $2 million someday. So, uh, but you just want to make sure uh, that you're going to actually provide value and that you outline it. Because one time, and I described this in the book, I got screwed, where a founder pulled my options and then told me, essentially, you could sue me. And what am I going to do? I'm going to sue a founder? Life's too short. So you have to build trust. And what I always do with, did with folks was when they asked me to be an advisor, I said, listen, if I'm not doing my job and you're not happy with me as an advisor, you can cancel at any time and I'll have just vested two, three, four, five months, whatever it is. And so it's your job to make sure I'm providing value. It's my job to make sure I'm providing value. And either of us can leave the relationship at any point in time. I don't take advisor shares now. So if you're thinking you're going to get to put my name on your company now for 25 basis points, no, I want to own 10% of your company now and give you cash for it. Ed, have you done advisorships? And what's your general advice to Shane? Yeah, so Shane, I, I, I generally agree with what Jason just said. I think Jason's model is really fantastic. I like the idea of advising as an investor together because it sends a strong signal to other investors hmm. that you believe enough in the company to invest in the company. Where you get into trouble as an angel is if you advise a company but you do not invest, and the reason why you're advising is to help the company fundraise. Because if you're doing that, then your reputation is on the line. You're sending this deal to other investors to help them fundraise, to raise capital for them. But then you yourself do not believe enough in the company to invest. And right. that's called a negative signal. And that actually harms the company's ability to ah. raise capital from other investors. Because so the other investor will ask, are you investing? That's right. And inevitably you say no. You have to give some excuse like, oh, it's not my stage or whatever. You know, you could give some excuse. But at, at the end of the day, it, it just feels weird to that mm -hmm. new investor. So I like taking advisory shares as an investor. But like Jason, I've also slowed down on advisory shares. You know, I'm doing syndicates now, and that's kind of where we get our ownership from. One of the things I learned over the year as an advisor is that you have what's called an adverse selection problem sometimes as an advisor. So here's what that means. When you find a startup that is kind of in a desperate state where not everyone believes in them yet, the company's just getting started, it's a new company, there's no investors yet, and they're looking for advisors, that company can be in one of two categories. It can either be a really good company to gem that's just waiting to break out and it's just really early that you're catching them and that's kind of why they're looking for help at this point. Then the other option is that it could be a company that other investors have passed on and that might, might not really be that diamond in the rough. And so sometimes there's this adverse selection problem you have where the companies that ask you to be an advisor might not be the ones mm. that actually become the most successful in the world. Right. Now, I'm, I'm an advisor to a company that has given me significant advisory shares that's worth half a million dollars now and the company has done well. And, you know, I got that. Do you feel that. you earned it? Do you feel like you did the work? Yeah, I felt I did. And that's kind of one of the things that I worry about as an advisor is your reputation's at stake as an angel and as an advisor. So if you do engage as an advisor, I recommend this following growth hack uh, for being a good advisor, which is to basically set up a recurring monthly phone call at least with a company where you can brainstorm ways for you to be value added. And that way you don't forget to help the company. Yeah. Okay. We have our next question from Cheryl. And she said, I started doing small angel investments via syndicates last year. I'm looking at establishing my own deal flow. Excellent. Now I am disappointed that most of my syndicates give insufficient updates on progress. And I think by that, you mean the startups you've invested in through those syndicates, because the syndicates don't give the updates the syndicates, the startups do. But I get your point. Would appreciate your feedback and ideas on how I can encourage information flow. So number one, we have started in the last 50 deals putting in our side letter, a side letter is an agreement outside of the normal investment documents, that the founders will agree to a monthly update, even a short one with key metrics from the business. So we've made it a contractual requirement here at Launch and Jason's Syndicate. That's a new thing. I believe we're the first people to do it, and it's really working. The second thing we did I had a number of companies who were not giving consistent updates, and they, lo and behold, needed more money. And they asked me, would I invest again? And I said, sure, we'll invest. How do you feel about 12 updates a year? Um, and here's the side letter, and we'll invest this amount if you agree to that. You know what they said? Sure. You know what? We've thought we should do this, and this is the right discipline for us to do it. So we've imposed this discipline on our founders. And when we say it, we say, we're not micromanaging you. We want to be invested with founders who have an hour a month to update their investors and they have the critical information they need at their fingertips. Because here's the, I think, the big tell, talking about poker and tells. 
if you don't have an hour to update your investors, it means you probably are doing poorly, which means you should update your investors so they can help. Or you don't have access to the data, which means you're flying a plane very fast with people on it without instruments. Either of these situations is dangerous. And very rarely is it that you're an up and to the right Uber, Thumbtack, and you know, don't worry about it, we got you kind of situation from the founder. So we've made it contractual. You don't have that ability with syndicates, but you do have the ability to email the founder and say, hey, it's Cheryl, I'm a small investor in your company. Please let me know if there's any way I can help with hiring or marketing if you're a marketer or technical stuff if you're a CTO. Um, and would love to get an update on the core metrics of the business quick on email or even just getting a quick coffee. Ed, what are your thoughts on getting updates as a syndicate member moving into proprietary deal flow phase? That's a great question, and I agree with what you said there. Um, I think it's a great innovation, what you've created in your legal structure for requiring that as an investment. I think it's very smart. And I think more founders should be doing that because if you are updating your investors often, it's, it's oftentimes a fundraising opportunity for you. Mm-hmm. So think about this as a founder. Imagine if you're building a company and you raise a round of funding, say, once a year or so. Well, if you're updating your investors every month, then you're keeping those existing investors appraised of your progress, which means you might get inbound requests from those investors to reinvest in your company, which shortcuts your fundraising process as a founder. So if you explain this to the founder on their terms to help you communicate to them, hey, I'm helping you do your job to reduce your fundraising burden, um, it generally resonates. And then on top of that, what I recommend to most founders is that they also include investors who passed on their company, such, as, their v- updates. such as their venture capital firms that might do the next round, for example. Right. Now, so you're marketing to them that you are a founder who appreciates investors, even the ones they don't yet have. Exactly. I mean, a lot of VCs will kind of build relationships with entrepreneurs manually. They'll check in with them every three months to see how they're, how they're progressing. But VCs can sometimes be bad at their own jobs and not necessarily sure. che- check in on the founders. So this is a way for you to do the jobs for the VCs by sending them updates about yourself. And then you're not coming to them begging them for money for the next round. They're coming to you, which puts you in a powerful negotiating position. Amazing. Great advice. Here's a question from Bruce. And boy, this one's a doozy. I was recently offered to participate in a Series A via a syndicate. There were no revenue figures given. There was no burn rate given. There was no runway information given. Runway being how if you burn 100K a month and you are raising 1.2 million, the runway would be 12 months. There were no pro rata rights to anyone in the syndicate. Within 24 hours before the founder could even get back to me, the allocation was full. So... Every investor went into this deal without any of this information. It's an assumption, but probably a correct one. Is this just the angel investing syndicate business that from what I can only guess, people invest based upon the leads experience because they obviously don't have sufficient information and time for due diligence? Great question. Bruce, why don't you start this one off? Sure. So it's a good question. Um, One thing that sometimes we struggle with as syndicate leads is the privacy question around a company because... If you think about it, right, let's say you're a very hot company that's doing really well and you have lots of choices for investors. We as syndicate leads and VCs as well have to almost apply to invest in this company. We have to justify our value add and why we are better than other investors to invest in this company. And so the negotiating leverage shifts to the entrepreneur as they get better and better traction and as, you know, if if their concept is really, really attractive as a venture investment. So, you know, given that we have to muscle our way into deals sometimes, sometimes there's a privacy concern around exposing too much information about the company to the syndicate, because if if we were completely transparent with everything, sometimes we might not get an allocation because the founder is thinking, well, I've got this one firm who is not a syndicate, which is a traditional VC. I could go with them. There's complete privacy for all of my trade secrets. If I go with that VC, my competitors will certainly not know about what I'm doing or could go with the syndicate, yeah. you know, they sometimes will choose the VCs. And so as syndicate leads, one way you can help us do our jobs is to kind of build a trust relationship with us that we are selecting deals that are of reasonable quality. And that's why picking a good syndicate lead like Jason is so, is so important. Well, thank you for the plug, Ed. Um, I think you can also go directly to the syndicate and build a relationship with them. I know that I have a number of people in our syndicate, and it's becoming a little bit of a customer service issue for us. We send an email, and we get about 40 
50 replies immediately with questions. Jason, what do you think about this? Jason, what do you think about? Jason, can you be my lawyer and read the documents for me? And it's like, okay, you have to have your own lawyer. You have to be able to do a little diligence yourself. I think one of the interesting things you have here is the allocation filling quickly. So when an allocation fills quickly like this, um, that gives no time for due diligence. We had this issue with our syndicate. So we do a one week uh, due diligence uh, period. It's like a cooling off period, buying a gun or something. We take a full week, we host a webinar, and we allow you to contact the founder themselves. We give you their email. We even give them the mobile phone number of the founder. Our thesis being great founders will want to talk to potential investors. And we have not had anybody abuse that privilege. If we did, we would take them out. So people get a full week. Then we send everybody a link saying, at noon on this day, you can then give us your allocation, but not before then. So if you email us and say, I'm in, that does nothing. You have to go to that form at noon on Monday uh, after you've watched the webinar, if you choose to do it, and we make everybody do a webinar. So that's your question about doing proper due diligence. I think other folks can't be bothered, and they're just like, trust me. And it's a little bit more passive. So you are trusting the syndicate lead. And I think it's reasonable to trust a syndicate lead with a small investment. You're not putting, if you're a syndicate member, more than five or $10,000 in typically. So yeah, maybe you, you can have a lower level of diligence, although I don't like that. I've tried to structure our syndicate to work around that. Ed's point is very correct. Information can leak and people don't like that. And, and I agree with you. And I just to add to this, you know, as, as a, a, a participant in a syndicate, like we talked about earlier, you should be going for a broader strategy of kind of being in a number of deals that are of good quality and, you know, kind of missing out on a very high quality deal can be very expensive as mm -hmm. an investor. And so, you know, one of the reasons why a particular investment might be scrutinized is because you might be attached to that particular outcome. And as a backer, I would kind of encourage you to not necessarily be attached to any one company succeeding, hmm. but rather be attached to the idea of your portfolio succeeding as a whole. And so any right. one particular investment, if it goes south and it fails, that's actually a cost of doing business as a backer. You're going for the broader strategy. Yeah. So if this was one out of 50 and you didn't have a ton of diligence done and it was a small dollar amount, you could look at it as a feeler bet. Sometimes I'll tell people I'm investing 25K in this company as a feeler bet. What does it mean? There's some things I like about it, but I'm not super confident. You know, it's, I just want to see where I'm at. So if in poker you had mid pair or bottom pair, you'd be like, well, there's a, there's an ace on the board. Somebody might have it, but I got the 10. So let me put out a small bet and see if somebody raises or two people raise. Now I really know I'm screwed because chances are one of those two people who raised and re-raised is going to have that ace. Or you're playing with absolute maniacs who just like to raise for the point of raising. Uh, and so you have to know what you're doing. Uh, the no pro rata is a big tell for me. We don't do deals anymore if we don't get pro rata. That is a little bit of a uh, tell for me as well that the founders of this company or this syndicate, this syndicate is not able to negotiate well because it's a very simple negotiation. We don't we always get pro rata. And if we don't get pro rata, we don't do it. Um, and you should respect your early investors and give them pro rata. Why wouldn't you? Um, and so either this, either the syndicate lead is not able to negotiate well and doesn't have a great reputation or can't be bothered to do pro rata, which means you can maintain your percentage ownership, uh, or this founder is a bit of a jerk and doesn't care about his invest his or her investors. What do you think? I agree with that. And I think that <clears throat> if, if it's an earlier stage bet, especially if it's a seed bet, then it's generally easier as a syndicate lead to negotiate pro rata rates. Mm. If, if the deal is later stage, if it's, for example, a Series A, Series B, Series C company, it depends on how hot the deal is and it depends mm. on who the lead investor is. Sometimes lead VCs can kind of, you know, muscle out smaller investors out of rounds. And so if you're going with a large syndicate like Jason or myself, we generally have more negotiating leverage because we're using collective bargaining power by writing a bigger check together. And this is why it's advantageous for you to go with a syndicate rather than investing necessarily in your own because you don't have that leverage on mm. your own. And so that, that applies not just to pro rata rights, it applies to price as well. Mm. Okay, let's take another question. This one is from Amy, who is a newbie angel. Uh, she says, if you are, it's question number 10, if you are supposed to double down on your best investments, why not just tag along on syndicated Series A and Series B rounds in companies if you have the opportunity to? Is this the same as doubling down on your most successful seed stage investments if 
you have an opportunity to participate in such rounds and you believe in the company, should you do it? Or is the valuation too high to be part of the angel investing model? Uh, so I think you uh, kind of answered your own question there. You may not have the opportunity to get in the Series B because in the Series B, and even in the Series A, you might not have the opportunity to get into those companies because the VCs now have 400, 600, 800 million dollar funds, billion dollar funds, and they want every possible share in that round. In fact, they will say, we're not doing this deal unless we get the entire round and we want people to waive their pro rata. These kind of things happen. So in the best companies, you will get elbowed out in the Series A or Series B in some cases, unless you have made the early investment and had pro rata rights. So I don't think that this is a great strategy uh, for angel investors to just try to get in Bs or As, because the As and Bs you might get into might be the ones where the VCs, uh, the top tier VCs are not doing them. I agree with you, Jason. And you always have to be wary about later stage rounds that have allocation available. If you don't trust your syndicate lead, it could be kind of a leftover deal where the VCs don't have full conviction to do the full round themselves. Mm. Now, if you do enough diligence and you're working with a good syndicate lead, then you can feel more confident about that. But if you're doing it on your own, it's challenging. Mm. In general, angel investors have more leverage earlier because if you think about the negotiating leverage of a company, the, the power shifts from the investor to the entrepreneur, the later stage the entrepreneur is. Mm. And so when a company is early and they're young and they don't have a lot of believers in the company at that point, you have the most leverage as an investor. You can get the best terms, the best ownership, the best valuation, the best rights for future rounds. And that tends to dwindle in later rounds. You can get the founder on the phone. You can get them for coffee. When the company is in a Series B or a Series C, and you're not going to even be able to get time with the yeah. founder. They don't need you. Plus and they also don't need the later round VCs. They might just pick the person who gives the least rights and the biggest valuation. Well, plus it's more fun. You know, as an angel investor, one of the things that I think about is how do I extend the value I can do as an entrepreneur, but also help lots of entrepreneurs at once? Hmm. Well, the, the moment in time that an entrepreneur needs you the most is generally in the earliest stages. It's in the seed, maybe series A, maybe pre-seed rounds when they're still figuring things out. Hmm. And that's where they need the help from you the most as as a VC, you're going to be on a board and you're going to be managing and providing governance to that company in later stages, and they don't need the angels as much at that stage. So it's the most fun earlier when you can help the company figure out their go-to-market, make a big impact, help them hire someone that's critical. Yeah. So it's valuable for the company too. Also, you have a lot more information if you're an angel investor in a company going into a Series A and a Series B, if they're sending regular updates, which we talked about recently uh, in the program. So you should be able to make a better decision. If you're going into a Series A or Series B blind, you've got to start from zero in knowing the founder and the team and the product and the market and the metrics. When you're a seed investor, you might have been following the company for two years. They get their Series A and all of a sudden you're in the catbird seat, as it were. Okay, let's take a question from Aaron. This is a little bit technical. How do you guys think about the valuation of companies that change, that charge a percentage of revenue from enterprise clients? Do they get the same as 10 to 20 times AR multiples in SaaS, if not why. It's uh, got a similar predictability and reoccurring, but I sense they get valued at half the SaaS companies, all other things being equal. You understand this question? Is he talking about people who, like, uh, like a square that would charge a percentage of, or a Patreon that charge a percentage or a Kickstarter of the revenue of the company that they're selling software into? I think that, that's what he's talking about. I think that's my read on it. Yeah, that's my read on it. Those companies are terrible because people don't value them uh, that much. If you look at Kickstarter and Patreon as businesses, they're loved, loved by both sides of the marketplace, but they have no pricing power. Uh, also, people doing donation-based businesses. Um, so you can't collect donations for a Kickstarter and take 30% like Apple does in their store. You can, and even if you take 5%, people complain, even though... 2.x or 3% of that is going to the credit card fees or square fees or Stripe fees. So it, those are terrible businesses. They can have big uh, GMVs, right? You can run a Kickstarter for $100 million or $20 million, and it looks like a lot of money's going through, but you only get paid a small amount on that $20 million. I mean, my, my general take on this in terms of multiples is that there's been a correction in multiples recently when the IPO markets dried up. Um, you know, an enterprise SaaS company might be valued at 5 to 6x ARR, not 10 to 20x these days. And so mm. um, 
So I think annual that, annual recurring revenue. Recurring revenue. Exactly. Right. So, you know, when you're an earlier stage company, when you're like seed or series A, your multiple on your annual recurring revenue is going to be a lot higher than when you're publicly traded. And so the question that you're asking, Aaron, may also be stage dependent because mm. as your company progresses through later stage stages and financing rounds, your multiple on revenue actually decreases. And the reason why it decreases is because your growth rate organically decreases as you get closer to IPO, which means that um, the multiple on, on your company is naturally going to be lower for a later stage deal. Mm. And so the correlation that you're seeing here might might be st- sector uh, stage dependent, not necessarily type of company dependent. Yeah. And, you know, the the multiples are not super important in the early stage. The entry price you're getting in at and what the early customers think about the company are probably more important. You know, if the valuation is reasonable and the customers love it and the company's growing and the churn rate is low, in other words, people canceling, those are the things you can look for that are probably more important than what it eventually gets bought for and what multiple the public markets are trading at because the public markets might be trading 20 times plus PE ratios now. I think it's kind of an all-time high, but you can't time that kind of stuff. Yeah. You know, Trump decides to do a multi-trillion dollar stimulus package. Maybe PE ratios go even higher and they start breaking records. Or if there's a war with North Korea, maybe the market tanks and we get back down to the low teens for PE ratios. It's out of your control. What is in your control? The pace at which you invest, the quality of the companies you invest in, and doubling and tripling down on the winners, all of that's in your control. So I try to focus on what's in my control. Yeah, and I, I would just add to that that when you're looking at a multiple and you're looking at how to value a company, in general, you want to be co-investing alongside larger investors that have negotiated that valuation in a professional way. You don't necessarily, as an individual angel, want to be setting that valuation yourself. Um, this is why having deep-pocketed friends can be valuable. Um, and then the multiple that you're getting on a company oftentimes depends on the growth rate of that company. Hmm. So if you have a company that's doing $5 million a year in revenue, but they're growing 10% a year, that's not really a, an exciting venture-backable company. If you have a company that's doing $2 million a year in revenue, but they're growing 3x per year, that's more interesting as a venture hmm. investor. And so the multiple can, can also be a factor of the growth rate, not just the revenue of the company. Yeah, the, vo- the velocity in which things are growing is critically important. I've seen companies that are doing $4 million a year, but they grew 20% year over year, and they've proven to investors that it's not a high-growth company, which then makes investors run for the hills. And you're like, well, but I got $4 million in revenue. It's twice as much as that other company. It's like, yeah, but that company is doubling every six months, and you're doubling every four year, three or four years, right? So it's just one of those things you got to keep in mind is the growth rate. Okay, here's a question from Samir, and this is a really interesting one. Any thoughts on a syndicate offering providing no pro rata rights, but the lead angel of the syndicate is getting pro rata rights. The reason for this is because the company raising money is offering pro rata rights only to those investing over a certain amount. Is this normal event or a definitive red flag? Typically, I prefer investing on the same terms as the lead angel in the syndicate. What are your thoughts on this, Ed? I haven't seen this happen. I haven't seen this happen either. Um, I have some quick thoughts. So, I'm, first of all, I might ask that syndicate lead why they're doing this. And WTF. Try to, yeah. Get to the source of the, of the reason here. Don't necessarily assume. Um, in general, when I invest and I assume when you invest, Jason, we're doing identical terms with the syndicate. Yeah. Because we, we want to be financially aligned with the syndicate. Yeah. That's what helps build trust. Plus, the syndicate is generally writing a very large check. You know, in your case, you've done multi-million dollar syndicates. Yeah. And so you're broken a million, yeah. Exactly. So in those situations, you are writing a big check. We are major investors. It doesn't make any sense. I, this seems like some weirdness. Maybe it's an inexperienced syndicate, uh, or it could be an error. Maybe, you know, and sometimes that happens. People are looking at it. And what I do uh, myself is I consider all of my, I in my documents, I say all of the entities which Jason Calacanis controls. So I include, you know, uh, my personal money, my corporation's money, the syndicate, and my fund's money, all one entity. They all get put into one bucket and I get the rights of what that bucket equals. Because I learned in the past that, oh, people are like, oh, you know, your syndicate is under the threshold for X, and your personal investment's under the threshold. But if you put the two together, it would be. So I think it's important for people who are investing to say, hey, when you put all of my different entities together, right, we have a fund, we have sometimes I'll personally put a little extra money in, 
and then we have the syndicate. You want to put all those entities together and representing one united front uh, with the company and the founder. I agree with you. And I would say that I would look at this on a case by case basis as well. There are situations where you know, not having pro rata rights might be appropriate. For example, let's say your syndicate lead is themselves are themselves a VC firm and they're writing a $10 million check and the syndicate is tiny. Let's say it's a hundred K syndicate, you know, in those situations for political reasons, it might not be possible with the other VCs in the round to get pro rata rights. Also ask yourself, are you going to be investing in the next round? Is this a later stage deal or is it an early deal? If it's an early stage deal, then there's, you know, if it's a seed round, then, you know, in general, you, you know, you should be doing your pro rata in future rounds, series A, series B. If this is a series D company, then the pro rata yeah. rights might not matter as much. Yeah, because you may not be able to keep up with the amount you have to invest. You may not have access to that much capital. Uh, and the people who are also side by side with you might be, as you're saying, investing 100 times that you're investing in. Maybe they deserve different rights than you. Um, we have a double question here from Gary and Stan. They're kind of related. Gary asks, do you invest as yourself, an LLC, or some other form, and why? Uh, and then related, Stan says, what's the legal structure used in making investments? I've made a few investments so far, and I've done them in my personal name in all likelihood. Uh, I'll do one or two deals per year, but I'm wondering if I should create a separate legal entity. If the answer is yes, what's the best structure and why? Um, we're not going to give legal advice on the show, but we can tell you what we do and why. Uh, and you're going to want to have a great attorney reviewing your documents and teaching you. So if you look at, I tell people, if you're going to invest a half million dollars of your $5 million net worth in startups, you know, spending, you know, maybe 5% of that $500,000 on legal work to educate you, look at it as a $25,000 tuition payment to sit with attorneys and learn uh, is a good idea. Um, some people will have a, a trust, which is typically an LLC and it passes through, right? So you get one times tax. You're never going to do this through a corporate entity because you pay double tax. So that would be weird. Uh, so I've never heard of anybody doing it from a corporate structure. That's bizarre. Uh, so it's either going to be in your name or an LLC, correct? That's right. We have an LLC for this exact reason. We like it because it limits liability. It's a layer of protection. There isn't a double taxation issue from a dividends perspective. And so that's a simplest structure. Yeah, it's a pretty simple structure. Also, if you have an LLC, um, just two minor things. The name, when it's on the cap table, could not resolve to you personally. So if you wanted privacy because cap tables sometimes float around. I've literally had people say, call me and say, hey, can I buy your shares in this company? And I said, how did you know I was a shareholder? Like, oh, well, we reviewed the cap table. And then we Googled your name and we contacted you on LinkedIn. And it's like, oh, well, thanks for that. But you know, these, these cap tables get around. Uh, so some people will put up a phony, LL, you know, just a nondescript name. So you can get a little privacy through an LLC. Also, you, if you have multiple people, let's say you had an angel investing group, you could have five people in an LLC, each putting in 500K or 250K each, having a million dollars or $2 million to invest. You could still invest different amounts, but you could have some sort of LLC structure. So you can put in a bigger check and run your own little mini syndicate, like a group of friends doing it. And you could add and move people and, and just keep track of that, right? I agree. I've heard of people doing that before. Yeah, I agree. I, I think it's a good, good paradigm. I also saw recently a um, a, a startup that had a lot of, the founder had a lot of friends who wanted to put checks in. And he didn't want to say no to them. But he also didn't want to collect signatures and have to give information and just go through, you know, having 50 different people who are friends of his, um, you know, signing docs and being on the cap table. So he created with one of his friends, I guess it was an investor in LLC. He had one of his friends create an LLC. Uh, to create an SPV, a special purpose vehicle, a syndicate essentially, uh, that didn't charge a carry, split the 15K and 10, you know, 12 to 15K in fees for 10 years of registering it and managing it between everybody. And that just made life simpler for everybody. And that's one of the nice things about being in an SPV. You don't have to, if you're invested in 50 companies like we are, or 150, you have to be able to sign paperwork at a moment's notice and review it. It's arduous. I agree. And that's why a lot of, you know, kind of mid to later stage companies generally are fearful of including angels in their round. Because first of all, it's not really worth their lawyer's time to do like a 10K check or a 15K check when it's a 10 or $15 million round. And then you're on the hook to then sign for the next round. And so the lawyers discourage it, the lead VC discourages it. And so syndicates give you that kind of collective bargaining power to muscle your way into those rounds. Hmm. And so, you know, by doing that, you're getting a lot of leverage. You're getting price leverage, because by combining capital together, you're able to actually negotiate the valuation a little bit better. You're getting pro rata rights. 
And even if you're not able to get pro rata rights formally, sometimes what we've done in the past is we've we've done what we call handshake pro rata rights, which is where if it's a really, really hot deal and every VC in the world trying to get into this company, in the past we have done deals without pro rata rights, but what we've done is we've negotiated with the founder that we will roll up our sleeves and help you and have spiritual pro rata rights with that I founder. Like it. And and we will justify our pro rata by actually helping the company. Right. And that has worked really well for us. And the founder will say and go to bat for you in later rounds and say, listen, Ed and his team did a great job. We should give them an allocation. Exactly. And you can't really get this as easily as an individual angel investor. So the syndicate model is very beneficial. All right. Our final question comes from Nils. He says, when you receive a quarterly update from a company you have invested in, what kind of information metrics do you expect to receive? I'll let you start off on this one. What are you uh, I'd say that the, the best kind of metrics that we look for are the following. We look for... First of all, where do they need help um, as a company? Because this is their opportunity to, to engage with us as an investor, so we can justify our pro rata, we can help the company get to the next milestone. So we, we want to make sure that they're always asking us for help. Then on, from a metrics perspective, we're looking for what's your current revenue, and that could be both your gross merchandise value of your revenue, your top line revenue, as well as your net revenue. Those are important to distinguish and separate from each other. We want to see kind of your growth rate month over month. So what percentage of your revenue has grown since previous months and what's the trend looking like? We're looking to, to be communicated about what are the biggest challenges the company is having right now? What are the obstacles? What's the general business update? Is there, has there been any news, any recent hires that are noteworthy? And then most importantly, we're also looking for runway. How much time is left until the next round? How many months, basically, as well as their current burn rate? And I'm going to take the opposite of this, which is what not to conclude. Um, number one, you're not writing... A book. If you get to over a thousand words, it's too long. That should be an in-person meeting. So I think whenever you get to that second paragraph, ask yourself, this should, in the second paragraph, the information in those next, the fourth, fifth, and sixth sentence of the section, that should probably be something you do either with a chart or a table or in person. Uh, number two, don't make it an attachment and make the attachment a 20-page PDF. What we're looking for is your ability as the founder to put the important stuff up top, and then in decreasing importance, the rest of the information. Other things that typically people don't care about, your speaking gigs, and like the 20th item on the roadmap. We don't need to know that you have a huge win because you added underline to Microsoft Word. We expect you to add underline to your Microsoft Word competitor. So I, I find sometimes people put Stuff that is not super important, maybe they lean on press or social proof or, you know, their speaking gigs and roadmap, and they leave out the important stuff. I love a chart. I love charts that are self-explanatory. You look at the chart and you say, okay, number of active users, right? And sometimes I see a chart that goes up and to the right so perfectly, I say, and says revenue. And I say, okay, is this uh, revenue for the month? And they say, no, no, that's cumulative revenue. And I say... Oh, that's a nice trick, but that means nothing. Of course, cumulative is going to go up and to the right. If you've got any revenue going in, it can only go in one direction. It's cumulative. So um, these are like little things that would make you lose credibility with the investment community. We want you to raise your credibility. So important stuff up top. Don't overwhelm people. Don't write war and peace. Keep it brief. If you can't, if you can... Cut out words, do that. So what I do is I read sentences, and I this is what I do in my books and my blog and personal writing, uh, or when I'm even on TV. I look at what I'm going to say, and I cut words out. And I try to say it in as few words as possible, and the fewest words you can use is a chart. I've also seen people do short videos and attach them, which is nice, like a message from the founder. Some people like that. I like the charts and the data. I don't like the founder, because sometimes it's just charming founders who can just spin and spin and spin. We will see through that. If there's no revenue mentioned, we assume revenue is a problem or there is none. If you don't put in how much cash you have on hand and when your cash out date is expected, we assume it's bad. I agree. And, and by focusing ourselves on those metrics, it's almost like an accountability system for yourself yes. to focus on the KPIs that matter. So as a CEO, it's actually very healthy to send these updates and to have these KPIs be broadcasted. Because, and this is kind of like a, a trick from kind of life coaching is that um, if you create public accountability for yourself, if you engage with a wide audience and establish a goal 
and declare that goal and then make yourself publicly accountable for that goal, it actually increases your chance of hitting that goal. Yeah. And this is a way to keep yourself accountable. This is why I put the domain name maryjason.com out there. It's just a domain name, people. Don't read into it. But you never know. I have the domain name, so from what I understand, I'm halfway there. But if you measure it, you can manage it. If you don't measure it, there's no way you can manage it. So you're trying to build up that credibility. Uh, so we hope this has been helpful. Thanks to Ed Roman for joining me. Thanks, Ed. Thank you very much. You did a great job. It was very good. And to talk. we got through a lot of questions. I don't know how many we got through here, but it looks like a dozen or so. Thanks to Emmy Award winning producer Jackie. And for all of the people who've supported the podcast, there's a number of ways you can support the podcast if you're so inclined to do so. We don't want your money. You don't have to give us money. We provide this for free. What you can do is you can rate the podcast on iTunes or other places where you listen to your podcast. And most importantly, you can just email angelpodcast.com to a friend and say, hey, check out this dope podcast where I learned a ton about angel investing. Or I'm a sneaky founder who listens to every episode twice to understand how to interface and get deals done with early stage investors. Either way, I want you to just take a moment right now and text angelpodcast.com, email it, share it in a group, and just spread the word, right? We're putting all this content out there. We're putting it out for free to help the community educate themselves and get better at what we do because the big problems in society are not going to be solved by our government. Go figure, right? Uh, or other governments and dictators out there. The big problems in the world are solved by entrepreneurs, and entrepreneurs need capital behind them to change the world. So by being an angel investor and spreading the word about this podcast, you're saving the world, literally. How's that for a pitch? Love it. It's a Thanks, pretty good Jason. pitch, right? It's Save the world. Pitch. Send my domain name, Angel Podcast, to your friends, family, and relatives. And go ahead and tweet it if you like. Uh, upcoming this summer, we have our Angel Summit in June. Third time we're doing it. I'm sure Ed will be there. Shooting guns. We're going to do clay pigeon shooting, hiking, wine. We go to great restaurants. We play patonk, which is the French version of bocce ball, or bocce ball is the French, the Italian version of patonk. I'm not sure. We have a great time. In Napa, 75 angel investors. They each get to bring uh, a founder with them. It's a grand old time. Join us in June for uh, in July for that Launch Angel Summit. And then LaunchFestivalSydney.com. We're going to have the Launch Festival this year in 2018 only in Sydney. And I'm going to be in Sydney for a week. And then we're going to dive the Great Barrier Reef with the speakers uh, from America. I don't know if Ed's coming. I think He's I'm on gonna, the fence. He's I'm, 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 I need halfway to, there. I, I think I will be taking uh, scuba diving lessons very shortly. It's a big commitment, but I think diving the Great Barrier Reef is like a once-in-a-lifetime bucket list. I think it's top 25. Sounds incredible. I, well, when you see the boat that I'm renting, it's a pretty amazing boat. <laughs> uh, we're gonna have a great time doing that. And uh, finally, most importantly, if you're a founder and you're listening to this, obviously you're listening all the way to the end, founder.university is a free program for founders. And we look for founders who are in our Goldilocks zone. What is the Goldilocks zone, you ask? It means you have a product in market with modest traction, two or three customers, a couple hundred users, but you don't have your Series A yet. So you're not too cold and you're not too hot. And we host it here at Wilson Sonsini, the top law firm in Silicon Valley, or what most people consider one of the top law firms, if not the, and we do it in their offices for two full days with 70 amazing founders. This program is priceless, but we've priced it at $0. So it's worth a lot of money. In fact, we've invested in a number of companies now coming out of it. Uh, so we've invested in a half dozen companies that have come. And we're going to run this program, I think, four times a year, maybe more. So if you'd like to come to founder.university, go to founder.university. There's a .university uh, domain extension now, which is great. Uh, and then we do angel.university, which is two day, one day program, sorry, to teach angels, just like this Q&A. But we do, you know, I think we had maybe 50 angels, 60 angels there last time. And it's just fun to hang out and trade best practices and learn and hear from different famous angel investors. Uh, we do that here in San Francisco. In the fall, we have our final event that we do, which is Launch Scale. Scale is for founders looking to grow their companies. So maybe you've raised a seed round or a Series A and you want to send your growth team, your CEO, your CFO, your CTO, your management team to launch scale. You can just Google launch scale. I think it's launchscale.net is the domain. And uh, that's another two day event. And we make it free for the first thousand founders who sign up. 
and we'll see you at any and all of these events. It's really worth taking the trip to San Francisco. It will change your life. If you have not been here before, save your money, nickels and dimes, work whatever you got to do. If it's a young person and you're hearing my voice right now, it's worth saving as much money as you can and coming to Silicon Valley and meeting people here and seeing what's going on. And all you got to do is get in a car and drive here with a couple of friends and find a cheap Airbnb, an hour drive outside of San Francisco and show up. And we want to be that place that you can show up for free. So go to founder.university and apply uh, or drive to Sydney. You might get wet on the way. All right. We'll see you all next time. Bye-bye.